Hi, I'm Susan Lewis from WRTI, and I'm here with Erin Bush, founder and artistic director of the Young Women Composers Camp. This camp is a two-week program in its third year, and I'm here with seven participants from the camps this year. Hi, everyone. Hello. So before I go any further, I just want to say congratulations to all of you. I've been listening to your music, and it is truly beautiful and amazing that, that you produced this in this two-week program. So I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Um, Aaron, last year, participants studied composition, met with professional composers, and composed works for one of the resident ensembles you had. This summer, the program's all virtual. So talk a little bit about your approach to the program, like the challenges and the opportunities that this presented. I love that you mentioned the opportunities because I think that so many organizations have been focusing on the challenges. And of course there are many, um, but what I really wanted to do when we decided to transition this camp online was to focus on the main pillars of what makes this camp great. Um, so one being a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a mentor through private lessons that was maintained through virtual lessons. Um, the opportunity to mingle with other composers who are your age, uh, from all over the world that was even enhanced this year with a virtual camp because we didn't have geographic restriction. Um, the ability to meet with professional composers from all sorts of different kinds of compositional walks of life uh, to get an idea of what different professions might be like. So all of those things I was trying to maintain in just retooling and kind of narrowing down the scope of what we were going to do. So we ended up just having two classes a day with a work share hour. Um, private lessons were scheduled on students' own time. Um, they still were able to complete a piece and get a premiere by a professional musician, which is another huge important thing that we're able to offer our students. Um, and I think it went really well from what I can tell. And so one of the advantages, I guess, is that you could expand the program significantly in terms of numbers of students. Yeah, because normally if we're, in a, if we're in person, we have to worry about um, if you're a minor, you need to have a chaperone with you all the time. We have to, of course, provide food, the logistics of moving groups of people from place to place, regardless of their age, um, just require a lot of people. So um, that, none of that was a factor this year. Uh, you know, adding one more person to a Zoom room is much easier to do. Of course, we still um, had to pair everyone with that individual mentor, but scaling a Zoom program is a lot more easy to do than scaling an in-person program. Right, and the age range was about 12 to 24, is that right? Yeah, it was expanded this year. Our youngest student was 12. Um, she, well, she turned 13 during the camp. <laughs> Normally, we focus on a high school-ish range, so like 14 to 19 is the range we've given. We've gone a little bit younger than that in the past. Like when Lucy came last year, she was 13. Um, but this year we really decided to open it up to undergraduates as well. It's been something I've been thinking about kind of ever since I started the program and have just been wondering, how do I make this happen and like not sacrifice the needs of any one group? Um, but since we moved to a virtual setting, it was a lot easier to try it out. And I think it actually went really well. So that's something that we're keeping in mind going forward. And when we can finally be together in person, we're working out how to make that, how to make that happen. Wow. So I understand from our conversation earlier this week that there's a timeline for the creation of a new work. And, and that is that about a month before camp, each student is assigned a solo instrument which is based on preferences the students submitted. And then a week before camp, each student was connected to the performer. And the second day of camp, the young composers met with those performers in Zoom sessions to learn more about the instruments. Mm -hmm. and then there were private lessons with the teachers and access to the performers. But at the end of the two weeks, the completed piece was sent to the performer and um, the composers had the opportunity to attend rehearsals with the performer. And then you have 50 brand new pieces of music. It's, it's amazing to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty, it's, it's on the quicker side, um, a timeline for a piece. Other, other summer festivals will often give you, you know, two months to, to complete a piece, maybe on a larger scale. Um, but the 
potential issues that we run into um, are many of our students come to us without a lot of compositional experience or with zero compositional experience. And we don't wanna pressure them to pr produce anything leading up to camp. So some of our students do come in with some sketches. We've had people come in with a completed piece before, but most of our students end up writing the, at least the bulk of the piece with us. Um, but you'd be surprised when you're in an environment when you're just being constantly stimulated, when you're surrounded by other people who are working on the same project, when you just have like access to all of these different resources, um, the creative juices can, can just flow a little more easily. So at least when I've been in those situations as a student, I find that if you focus too much on that, I only have two weeks to do this. Um, it doesn't actually really feel like two weeks in the moment. It, it feels like a much more spread out period of time. Right. Well, and the seven composers we have with us today are composers whose works are being featured in WRTI's Back to School Week. So let's meet everyone. Uh, first, Bridget Bourne, 22-year-old from Victoria, Australia, who got up very early to do this Zoom call, and I guess to go to the camp itself. Indeed. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Bridget? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you. So... Tell us about your piece. So uh, my piece is for uh, clarinet. It's called Wood Grooves. And um, I like to call it a reverse deconstruction of a groove. So the groove is sort of carved out um, sort of fragment by fragment until uh, it's in full swing. So if deconstruction is taking something apart, reverse deconstruction is putting it back together? Correct, yeah. So I started with a full groove and I um, experimented with um, taking a few notes out. So I um, started off with just a couple of notes. Um, it's mostly, it's, it's a one note with, a, with an extra little um, 12th jump. And then I added it in one note at a time. So all of the Gs or all of the B flats until um, the groove put itself back together. It's, you know, as I was listening to it, it started to sound more and more like jazz or, or, or have a jazz sensibility to it. Is the groove you're talking about both visual and musical? Yeah, I would say so. I think um, uh, Emily Tello did a fantastic job of embodying the groove, um, really bringing out the, the um, jazz elements that um, can be brought out of the clarinet and out of the groove. Do you play clarinet? I don't, which is part of the reason why I chose it. Um, I wanted to um, take the opportunity to work with a, a, a performer who plays an instrument that I'm very unfamiliar with. Um, so it's uh, one of the instruments that's sort of furthest from my other instruments that I've worked with before. Um, I considered saxophone because it does similar things to uh, the ideas I had in mind, but um, even saxophone has similar fingering to the flute, which I have played in the past. So I um, tried to get as far away from any instrument as um, that I've played as possible. Interesting. Uh, did you think of the idea before you knew the instrument or did the instrument influence your choice of the idea? The uh, instrument definitely influenced my, my choice. Um, I was looking at saxophone music uh, to inspire the clarinet music as well. Um, but uh, I did uh, want to look at instruments that have a lot of extended techniques um, and trying to work with those in a very idiomatic way. So learning how to use multiphonics in a way that is um, comfortable for the performer and, and slap tongue, things like that. Um, so uh, <laughs> those sort of ideas, learning to look at extended techniques influenced my instrument choice and uh, my instrument choice then influence what techniques I wanted to use. Uh, cool. It was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy Marone. Hello. Lucy. Lucy is 14 from Philadelphia. Did we lose? There you are. <laughs> so Lucy, tell us about your piece, Beneath the Billows. So I also wrote my piece for solo clarinet. Um, and I really based it off of how if you're ever underwater or in an ocean or something like that, there's a lot of give and take with like tides and how sometimes it's, it can be like really smooth sailing and you're, you feel kind of lyrical. And then other times you are like fighting to get past. 
So um, at the beginning of the piece, it's very smooth and lyrical and there's nothing really harsh about it. And then as you move uh, towards the end, there's a lot more accented notes. So it kind of gives a little harsher um, feeling to it. And then it kind of goes back to the lyrical, so. Um. Did you have a particular experience in mind when you wrote this? Um, well, I spend a lot of my summers uh, down the shore. So I'm kind of always surrounded in that atmosphere. So it's, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too hard to transition that experience. Cool, yes, I love the shore too. <laughs> Uh, okay, Mondriana Viegas. Hello. Hello. So your your work is fanfare for naught. You are sixteen from New York City. Is that right? Yes. Tell us about fanfare for naught for solo horn. So I figured I would take the opportunity in this camp to really experiment with a style that I'm not used to writing in. I like to write in a lot of like serious tones, but I thought I would try something more humorous and whimsical. And I wrote for solo French horn and I wanted to do something very fanfare because I figure that's what we most typically associate with like French horn and other brass instruments. And to make it more fun and playful, I kind of wanted to poke fun at itself, do something very typical and very expected and then change something, just a little thing that like you can Pay attention to. Interesting. I was going to ask you, how do you make music playful? Like, what what are the techniques? <laughs> I had a hard time with that, but um, what I came up with with my French horn player, um, Kara Sims, is that we wanted to do like really long, unnecessary pauses. So, if you can see in the recording, there's a part where she kind of stops and looks around a little bit, and I think that adds the the whimsy to the piece. Cool. Wow, thank you. Now, Audrey Wu, 18 years old from Lexington, Massachusetts. Hello. Hi. So how are you? And, and tell us a little bit about your piece, Arrivals and Departures. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing great, thanks. Um, so my piece, uh, Arrivals and Departures, was written for um, a percussionist uh, named Clara Warner, and she's absolutely amazing. Um, and I, I chose percussion because, uh, like Bridget said, I wasn't very familiar with all the um, kind of different tactics you can use when composing for percussion. Um, so I really wanted to just uh, dive deep into something I was really uncomfortable with or just didn't know a lot about. Um, and uh, about what Erin said earlier about like finding inspiration, I actually, that really resonated with me because I did not come into camp with a very structured idea. Um, I didn't have any pre-write um, or sketches or anything, but um, I actually got my inspiration from uh, on July 6th, uh, as you guys may know, um, the Trump administration kind of ruled um, that international students studying in the United States would be sent back um, to their home country if their classes um, were online, like depending on what their colleges declared. Um, and so that, uh, kind of struck with me, um, especially since right now I am a student in the US who's um, trying to travel overseas. In summary, um, my piece was inspired by um, kind of uh, talking to my mother after this ruling about um, uh, the international student ban. And um, she kind of told me a bit about uh, her experience with um, moving countries and um, studying abroad. Uh, and then eventually, um, uh, like actually immigrating. So um, some of the text in my piece, it's a mix of percussion and electronics. So some of the text in the electronic recording um, is actually her voice. So I recorded um, her speaking and I asked her to say what she said to me and she was like, what are you talking about? Why are you making me do this? <laughs> um, but, but she agreed to do it um, totally. And uh, so yeah, you can hear my mom's voice in the recording. Well, thank you so much. Let's see, next we have Grace Coberly, 20 years old from Chicago, Illinois, whose piece is Earthworms Following Heavy Rain. Hi. Hi, Grace. So tell us about your piece. This is the first time you've written a percussion piece. Yes, it's the first time I've written for percussion. Um, I actually didn't know that flower pots were an instrument uh, mm -hmm. before starting the camp. 
didn't know you could bow a vibraphone until two weeks before. So this was definitely new territory for me. Um, but I've just, I had just started listening to percussion music and I was really fascinated by um, just the way that writing for percussion is, it's very limiting. There are you know, certain ways you have to play an instrument. One person, one soloist has two arms and two legs and they have to stand up on one leg so you can only do three things at once. Um, but then in another way, there are so many possibilities and so many different experimental techniques and instrument treatments that, that you can use. Well, I was going to ask if it's difficult to write for an instrument, any instrument, but particularly percussion, which in this case, flower pots and bowed vibraphone seem rather unusual. It, it must be difficult enough if you're in the room with one of them. How do you compose virtually? It, it definitely was difficult. I usually write choral music and I can do that sitting at a piano. Um, for this, I got a bunch of glass bowls from around my house and put them on my bedroom floor. And I just sat there for hours hitting the bowls with spatulas and wooden spoons and then singing the vibraphone part. Uh, so it, was, it wasn't exactly what flower pots sound like, but it did the job. <laughs> so I didn't really hear the piece. Um, as it was supposed to sound until the final performance. It's quite engaging. Congratulations. Thank you. So now we have Cecilia Olszewski. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. And you are 16 years old from Wallingford, Pennsylvania? That's right. And tell us about your piece, Isolate. Right. So my piece is called Isolate. I wrote it for a solo oboe, it's actually my first piece that I've written for a soloist. I usually just do um, ensemble work. So I was thinking about the word isolate, obviously in terms of quarantine and self-isolation, but also the idea of being a solo performer and being in that place of vulnerability and having like that freedom to kind of work with the music in a way that you choose to. Um, so yeah, I wrote it with, both of those definitions in mind. Interesting, uh, because I saw in your intro when you talked about how self-isolation might affect you as a, as a performer, how does it affect you as a composer? Hmm, that's a good question. I think it was actually, this camp was really helpful because I got to have a lot of back-to-back um, -back communication on writing because I think as a composer, it's usually a very personal thing and you're all, you're usually kind of isolated, right? Because you're writing it, unless you're collaborating, you're writing pretty much on your own. Um, so it was really nice to have the opportunity to talk to my instructor and my musician and the campers. It was very helpful. Right. Well, great. Salin Gokova is next. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hear you? Can you hear me? Yes. So, Salin, you're 21 years old from Turkey, Istanbul. Yes, correct. And your piece is called Wanderer. Uh, yeah, um, it's for um, solo viola, and I wanted to explore the idea of wandering without like knowing where to go next, what to do. Um, so, to do this, I included like modulations and a lot of transitions throughout the piece. And like whenever the piece modulates, I wanted to make it feel like you are in a brand new place with like um, endless opportunities. So that was the idea. Do you play viola? No, not at all. I mean, I've never seen a viola in my life. So that was interesting to write for it. Wow. So what, where did your piece come from? In, in terms of your experience, do you like to travel or did you like to travel before the pandemic? Yes, I mean, um, if it was like a normal summer, I would probably be traveling now. Um, I really love solo traveling um, because like you don't know really like where to go next, who you will meet. So um, it's like really a huge part of my life, like traveling. So I thought like, because I can travel, I think, I wanted my piece to travel instead of me, I guess. So um, that was my solution to being in lockdown, I guess. Great. Well, thank you so much. 
we got everybody, right? It's so interesting to me how all, you have all created music. Much of the music is from your own experience. I wanted to ask anyone who wants to answer, why do you compose? Is writing music a way of interpreting your experience in the world? Does it, does it help you work through something or is it, is it an expression of something you've already kind of concluded? What does music do for you? What does writing music do for you? Anybody? Grace. Um, for me, growing up in choirs, um, music has always been about connecting a group of people and making a community around the performance and listening to music, um, just making it together. So I started writing music, particularly choral, because it would allow me, even from the outside, to bring a community together um, around the same thing that I've enjoyed my whole life. So even writing for a soloist, um, it is, I think, what's a good way to put this? Composition has been really important to me in quarantine because I'm not allowed to participate in choirs or to direct, direct the pit orchestra at my school um, because we can't do those things physically together. But getting to write this piece, even just for one person, was a way for me to connect through music with someone else, which is the point of it to me. Great. Was it, what was it like to be matched with a performer? And, and were you all, any of you want to talk about how you felt when you saw that performer perform your work at the end? Was it the way you imagined it would be? Lucy. So uh, I worked with um, Emily Tello and I'm a clarinetist. So I thought it was really interesting being able to work with her and seeing like, this is how good I could be because she's amazing. <laughs> so I thought that that was really interesting just to see like how advanced and how she could take something that I'm able to do and turn it on its head 10 times. So I really liked that. Great. Anybody else? Cecilia. Sorry. Um, from the opposite perspective, I had never played oboe before and I was like really not familiar with the instrument until I was writing for it. So getting to hear it officially performed, like not on a MIDI track and not like on a robot sounding audio was really great because it did, Jasmine did end up playing it exactly as I envisioned it, which was really incredible to see. That's great. Well, you know, the, the whole idea behind this camp, giving um, you all a chance and encouragement to compose and, and really express yourself in music. Um, what was the most valuable aspect of the camp for, for you? Does anyone want to talk about that? I could talk about it if nobody else wants to right now. Um, I think one of the most valuable aspects to this camp that I've told Erin like countless times is that um, like the mentorship aspect is was really important to me. I think um, last year when I did it in person and this year when I did it online, um, the uh, that aspect did not change at all um, going from in person to online. And I think it really was because of how committed um, and dedicated um, a lot of our mentors were. Um, and I think just ha even, I mean, obviously studying from them and kind of uh, taking their advice, but also even just having them as a sort of presence of, hey, these are people who are like me in a certain way, who have been able to make this their profession and make this their life. And um, it's not just some lofty dream that I've had sitting alone in my room, like with nobody look to look up to. Um, it's actually connecting with someone who has made it their reality. And I just think that's really beautiful. And that's been one of the most important parts for me. It's wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for showing up to this Zoom session. It's been really fun to talk to you, and it's really fun to listen to your beautiful music. Also, the video is terrific because it shows, it shows the performers in all different settings. And congratulations, and I hope I hear more of your work in the future. It's been wonderful meeting you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Susan. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you.